And so the book of Nahum ends up because it's not the nation of Israel, but it's rather the Antichrist kingdom, the apostate nation of Israel, following him, Babylon, Nineveh, it's called here. And so the last verse there, Nahum chapter 3, verse 19, There is no healing of thy bruise, thy wound is grievous. All that hear the, the brute of thee shall clap the hands over thee, for upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? That's the state of Babylon is fallen, is fallen, as Revelation chapter 18 tells you about. Satan's kingdom comes to an end. It's completely destroyed. No good news for him. The good news is for the believing remnant who come in as a result with the Lord Jesus Christ and rule forever uh, with him on earth. Habakkuk now. Uh, chapter 1 of Habakkuk is Babylon persecuting the little flock of Israel. And again, like you, uh, you have these near fulfillments and far fulfillments. So you have the near fulfillment under Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. We saw that in the book of Daniel. In the persecution. Well, now this also refers to the nation of Babylon under the Antichrist in that coming kingdom, the tribulation period. You see the cry of the believing remnant in the tribulation in Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? So they're saying, you know, how long is this going to go on? Um, God's, but God will bring judgment. Um, first, though, he's got to judge. He's got to judge Israel. He's got to purge out the apostate nation of Israel before he can save the remnant. He does that by the Babylonian captivity in Habakkuk's day, and he does it through the Antichrist, through the tribulation period, so that a believing remnant will come out at the end. And so you see there in verse 5 where he's raising up the Chaldeans, or raising up Babylon, it says, Behold, the heathen in regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For though I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the Lamb, to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. Uh, so he's going to raise up that nation against, against Israel, so that a believing remnant will come out of them, both in uh, the days of Habakkuk and also the days of the tribulation period, uh, still future. Uh, verse 11, you can see the, the pride there of the ruler who comes. That's Nebuchadnezzar in Habakkuk's day that's the Antichrist in the future it says then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend imputing this his power unto his gods that's the change that takes place with the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation period he seems he makes a covenant with Israel for seven years and he seems to be following the law he has those daily sacrifices going but then in the middle of the tribulation period his mind changes he sets up the abomination causes desolation he takes away the basis he requires all to serve that image that he sets up uh, or else they will be destroyed he all requires all to uh, take upon him his mark and he says he's going to impute his power into his God that God is the God of forces we saw that in Daniel chapter 11 verses 38 and 39 that he gives his power to um, and so that's you know a reference here to the Antichrist and what he does there in the middle of the tribulation period uh, but so then during that time the wicked are going to be prospering and you see there in verse 15 it says they take up all of them with the angle they catch them in their net and gather them in their drag therefore they rejoice and are glad therefore they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous so that's the apostate nation of Israel trying to kill the, the believing remnant of Israel and it says they catch them in their net. That's their religion. And so verse 16 where it says they sacrifice unto their net. They sacrifice not unto God, God but unto their religion. It's all about the religion there. And that's what they try to capture up the believing remnant into. Uh, same thing what Satan does today. He appears to be an angel of light using the religion of Christianity to catch up people into him so that now if you've already accepted Jesus as your Savior then he can't take away your soul but he can keep you from being edified and keep you from being a witness to others as so that's what he tries to do today and uh, the tribulation period too he's going to try to catch them up taking God's name and that religion that the Antichrist sets up and trying to catch the believing remnant away from God's word trusting in God's word and trusting in that religion which is really Satan's religion 
chapter 2 now the Lord's going to destroy the wicked apostate nation of Israel and the just the believing remnant is going to live in God's eternal kingdom on earth but they got to place their faith in God's law covenant with them and that's what verse 4 talks about it says and we do need to deal with this even though we don't have time but it, because this is an important passage Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 says behold his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him but the just shall live by his faith so you have the contrast of the apostate nation of Israel following the antichrist they're not upright but the just they're going to live through that tribulation by faith faith in God's word and it says the just shall live by his faith so they live by their faith in God's word that's what gets them through to have the works to obey the law of covenant that's why James says faith without works is dead and he says that you have to have works that a man in James chapter 2 verse 24 says that a man is justified by works and not faith alone in that, uh, in that tribulation period that's the case it's by his faith that he continues the works of the law of covenant and continues following the Lord hold your place there and go over to Romans chapter 1 Paul quotes this it's one slight change to it under the leading of the Holy Spirit Romans chapter 1 verse 16 Paul says for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith he takes out the word his Habakkuk 2 4 says the just shall live by his faith in Israel's program they had to have the works and so they live by their their own faith in God's law as demonstrated by the works that they had obeying God's law covenant but today under the dispensation of grace we're not saved by works we're not kept by works we're saved by faith alone and so it says that the just shall live by faith the word his is taken out because we don't live by our faith but we live by the faith of Jesus Christ Galatians chapter 2 chapter 2 verse 20 and I know we're over time and we still got things to cover but this is a very important thing to grasp here Galatians 2 verse 20 says I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me all the new translations change this only the King James keeps it where it's the faith of the Son of God now this is not talking about uh, salvation uh, from hell but rather it's talking about uh, living a sanctified life a life pleasing to the Lord and to do so it's not you living anymore it's Christ living through you and so you live and live a life pleasing to the Lord by the faith of the Son of God so when Paul talks about it's the same concept as far as Habakkuk 2 verse 4 says the just shall live by his faith so they live in their own faith in God's law and doing those works chapter 1 in today's dispensation we live by faith to serve the Lord but it's not our faith it's the faith of the Son of God working through us because we don't live anymore Christ lives in us and in order to, to live by that faith in order to be edified in the Lord in order to serve him it's not us but it's Christ doing that through us and so it's the faith of the Son of God so a little subtle change the word his is taken out but it means to, you know because it means two different things in two different dispensations salvation is always by faith regardless of this dispensation but it's by the faith of whatever God says and in the dispensation of Israel it's enduring until the end to be saved so you live by your own faith but in today you're saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and it's his faith that he had that enables you to live for him live that sanctified life because you are dead in him you are buried with him in baptism Romans chapter 6 verse 4 tells you important distinction there the just living by faith in Habakkuk's day under the law they would live doing those works okay so then you have uh, back in Habakkuk chapter 2 verses 5 through 8 is God's judgment of the Antichrist at the end of the tribulation period um, let's see 
if we look down at verse 14, it says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's after God has taken away the Antichrist, after the tribulation period is over. And in the millennial reign, uh, he's, you've got the knowledge of the Lord covering the earth just like the waters cover the sea, such that that's why people will live for the Lord. Because if you don't have that knowledge, if you don't have the knowledge of God's word, then when you can be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, as Ephesians talks about. Or in the case of Israel's dispensation, if they are told to follow the Antichrist, they're not trusting in God's word, then they go ahead and do that. But once the tribulation period is over, the knowledge of the Lord covers the waters, cover the sea, well then they're not going to trust in falsehoods like that, but they're going to trust in what the Lord says and follow the Lord. Um, the details of this is given over in Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 9. And uh, it's really showing you that as a result of the knowledge of the Lord covering the sea, you don't have bloodshed. You don't have people killing each other. You don't have animals uh, killing each other. Everybody's a vegetarian at that point uh, because of the knowledge of the Lord covering uh, the earth. That's not that we should be vegetarians today. It's all things are lawful for us to eat today. It's a different dispensation at a different time. Um, and we don't really have time to go into that. but uh, So then you look in um, verse 15 there of Habakkuk, chapter 2. I did want to mention this. It says in verse 15, it says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. This is not what the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about in chapter 10, verse 42. There he is talking about how the one who gives a cup of cold water to drink to the believing remnant, those God will reward. That's a reference to in the tribulation period when that mark of the beast is there, those who don't take the mark can't buy or sell. And so the believing remnant, they go hungry, they don't have water. And so Jesus says, you'll be blessed for blessing Israel by giving them some water to drink. This here, though, is a reference to, it's not talking about literal water, but it's rather the cup of drunkenness uh, there. So it's not water, it's wine. And, the, and it's not literal wine, it's talking about spiritually speaking. Uh, because like the, the Antichrist religious system makes the nations drunk with religion. They're drunk, they're not sober-minded under Paul's terms. That's what Paul would use. They're not sober-minded, they're drunk, and so they're not thinking correctly. And they think what the Antichrist is doing is okay. Uh, Revelation chapter 18 verse 3 is a reference to that where the Antichrist religious system makes the nations drunk. And so what it talks about here in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 15, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. That's a reference to the person who tries to put the Antichrist religious system onto a member of the little flock. That person, woe unto him, uh, because he's pushing religion and leading that person astray. That's as contrast to what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 10, where he gives, where they give a literal cup of water to drink for the helping, blessing Israel, blessing the believing remnant who would not take the mark and is not getting food and drink as a result. Chapter 3 now is where Jesus comes at the end of the tribulation period to destroy the wicked. He lifts the curse of sin from the earth and he establishes his kingdom. And you see him destroying the wicked out of Jerusalem there in chapter 3, verse 12. It says, Thou didst march through the nation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Even though the, that's Jerusalem, and even though there are Jews there, that's the apostate Israel. They're not believers. believers. And so believers, it's not just heathen doesn't always mean the Gentiles, although usually that's what it means. In this context, it means those who are not trusting in the Lord. And so that includes Jews of the flesh. They're not Jews of, they're not the Israel of God. So it says, Thou didst march through the land in indignation, through Jerusalem there, thou didst thresh the heathen in anger, the unbelievers, the apostate nation. Verse 13, Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundedest thy, the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. And so that's, that's the we're sort of at the end of the book of Habakkuk. That's God's answer to the cry there at the beginning. It was Habakkuk chapter one verse two. They said, "The believing remnant says, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear. Even cry out unto thee of violence. And thou wilt 
mountains? The answer is really to the end of the tribulation period. And that's when God comes forth there at the end and he brings salvation for his people, destroying the wicked. And uh, we, it ends there, the last three verses there, as you can see Habakkuk ending where it's a tough time for them to endure the tribulation period, that believing remnant. Verse 17 says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. So that's the nation of, of Israel, the apostate nation. They're not bearing any prosperous fruit uh, through their religious system that's against God. You don't have the spiritual life there. That's the olive. And you don't have the uh, fig. You know The religion that they bring forth is false, and so it's not bringing a good fruit from there. So it's not yielding any meat. The flock is cut off from the fold. That's the believing remnant the, uh, of Israel. They're cut to go into the wilderness away from Jerusalem uh, there's no herd in the stalls but yet will I rejoice in the Lord I will joy in the God of my salvation because they're waiting for the Lord they know they trust in him to deliver them at the end of the tribulation period verse 19 the Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet and he will make me to walk upon mine high places so the Lord God promises to deliver the nation of Israel the Israel of God the people who are trusting in the Lord and he'll deliver them from that apostate nation and so that's the answer to the cry at the beginning of the book how long will I cry? well I'll cry until the end of the tribulation period when God delivers me therefore I'm going to wait for him and I'm going to live by faith and obey God's law of covenant and endure until the end look at uh, chapter 1 God's day of wrath against apostate Israel is near and he's going to cleanse the land. You see there in Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 2, he says, I will utterly consume all things from off the land. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. So he's going to completely purge the land so that it will be purged of its wickedness so that it can be so a holy God can live there. You can see the things going on, verses 4 through 6. You see the great idolatry in Jerusalem. I will also stretch out mine hand. This is verse 4 of chapter 1 in the book of Zephaniah. I will also stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of the Chimerans with the priest. And them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops. And them that worship and that swear by the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. And that swear by Malcolm. And them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired for him. Notice what you have there. You have these groups that are not serving the Lord. They're serving idols, or they're serving uh, Satan. They, you've got the remnant of Baal there, the name of the Shimmerans. Verse 5, it talks about the worship of the host of the heavens. But notice what's in the middle of those groups. It says there in verse 5, it says, And I'm going to cut off them that worship and that swear by the Lord. That's that false religious system, what the Pharisees were doing in the book of Matthew. They said they were following the Lord. They said they were okay. But yet they're not okay. In the book of Zephaniah in that time, when we were studying back a couple books back where we talked about how they were paying off the judges, they're paying off the priests, they're paying off the prophets, and the Lord is going to give them peace. Well, that's what they're doing here. They're worshiping the Lord. They're seeking after the Lord supposedly doing is they're just paying them off with money and they're doing going through the motions just so God will be okay with them and the word to the nation of Israel through Zephaniah is that these people who say they're following the Lord they're just like all the other heathen they're just like all the other nation the rest of the nation they're serving idols it's those who say they're worshiping the Lord and swear they're just like those who are worshiping Baal or those who in verse 6 those who are not even seeking the Lord or not inquiring for him. They're just like them. And in fact, they're worse because they're taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. They're saying that they're a part of the Lord. They're serving him, but they're really not. And so it's just a, a uh, indictment here in Zephaniah of the religion that the nation of Israel has in them. That even those who seem to be serving the Lord, God's going to cut them off too because they're not serving him. They're just following religion. And they're just as bad as those who God lumps them in right in the middle with all these other groups that are serving idols or not even doing anything. The atheist. Um, 
verses 7 and 8 there, you have, uh, Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guests, and it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. Boy, there's a lot in that, but the day referring to God's wrath, which he will do at the end of the tribulation period. He says basically it's at hand here, and he's going to punish those. The end of verse 8 says, those who are clothed with strange apparel of the righteous ones, according to Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, also chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. If you remember back there, it talks about the righteous being clothed in white. God dresses them in white. They shall walk with me. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy, he says. Those who suffer through and endure through the tribulation period. Those who are not clothed in white, they are not God's people, and so uh, they are clothed with strange apparel. That's foreign apparel. They are not white apparel. It's something different. Therefore, these are not God's people. So you have the God separating out in Israel, the apostate nation, from the believing remnant, and those who are not believing remnant are the ones identified by the ones who are in strange apparel. They're not going to be wearing white, and so God is going to cut them off there. And that's it, God's coming judgment. It's in the sense that just like the kingdom of God is at hand in the book of Matthew, now it's still 400 years before that, but still God's judgment, even though the tribulation period hadn't even come now in Israel's program, it was still a good, you know, at least 400 years away when Zephaniah is writing. But still, because these people, they could die uh, at any moment, they're going to suffer God's wrath. And so the day of the Lord for them is at hand. If they are serving other idols, or even if they claim to be serving the Lord, if they are not obeying God's law covenant, if they're not trusting in the Lord, if they don't have faith in Him and serving Him through what He said in His Word, uh, then they're going to receive God's wrath at the day of the Lord. And for them, once they die, that's sort of at hand for them already. Okay. Uh, and, and God is warning them of that because they think that God is powerless to stop them because they think they're serving God. And that's what verse 12 tells you. Chapter 1, verse 12, it says, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees, that say in their heart, The Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. So the Lord's not doing anything. So they can do what they want, basically. Uh, but verse 14, The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. So uh, that day is coming. Verse 15, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. So God's warning the nation of Israel through Zephaniah, just because you take on God's name, you're not, you're not going to be okay. And just because you think God's not listening, He is listening. His wrath is going to come upon you soon, so you better shape up here, basically. Uh, chapter 2 is God's judgment coming upon the Gentiles. And that's sort of a precursor because Israel is going to need to seek the Lord if they're going to live after God pours His wrath upon the whole world. So God's going to pour it upon the Gentiles at the end of the tribulation period. But He's also going to pour His wrath upon apostate Israel. Uh, so they're lumped in as part of the world too. They're not the Israel of God if they're not believing in the Lord. And so... Uh, you see there the call to them, uh, verse 1 of chapter 2, Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation, not desire. Before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness, and may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. It's the same message that Peter proclaimed on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. They crucified the Lord. They were guilty of killing their Messiah and God's wrath was going to be coming upon them. But if they were to repent and be baptized, they'd be saved. So too, the message with Zephaniah, the, the day of God's wrath is at hand. But the good news is they still have a chance to repent. They still have a chance to turn to God and He will heal them. So that's God's caution of Israel to repent. And then you have God's judgment of the nations, the Gentiles, uh, through the rest of this chapter here. Uh, chapter 3 then is God's going to destroy the apostate nation of Israel so that the believing remnant can safely dwell with their king Jehovah God in the land forever. 
So you know, chapter 1, it talked about how he's going to consume the man and the beast. He's going to take all everything off of the land. He's got to do that. He's got to purge the land. He's got to get rid of the wickedness because the holy God cannot dwell among uh, unholiness or else he would be, the Lord Jesus Christ would be defiled. And so when he comes at the end of the tribulation period, he's going to come and destroy uh, the wicked, both in Israel and among the nations. And uh, so, and the reason is because that way he can get rid of all the unholiness, all the uncleanness, all the defilement of the Lamb. And so now Jerusalem will be clean, and now he's going to gather his lambs into his arm, the believing scattered among all the nations, going to gather them, bring them into Jerusalem, and that they can rule and reign with him there forever. And so you see there in chapter 3, uh, verse 1, it says, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. So that's woe to the apostate nation that is gathered in Jerusalem, uh, the Antichrist ruling there. Uh, verse 2, She obeyed not the voice, she received not correction, she trusted not in the Lord, she drew not near to her God. So there's woe upon her. So the call is, you know what it was in chapter 2, verses 1 and 3, it's to repent, it's to seek the Lord. If you're going to be part of that believing remnant, if you're going to be in part of God's kingdom on earth, you need to forsake this system that the Antichrist sets up, the oppressing city, the filthiness, the pollutedness of it all. You can see the corruptness of it. Verse 3, her princes within her are roaring lions. That's the rulers under the Antichrist. Her prophets, verse 4, are light and treacherous persons. So that's the those false prophets. Uh, her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence. Violence, setting up that abomination that causes desolation in the temple. That's you know desecrating the temple there. That's polluting the the temple there. Uh, but verse five, the Lord is in the midst thereof, and so He's got to bring judgment upon them. He's going to destroy them. Uh, verse six, He's already cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. So now He's coming after Jerusalem. He's already cut off the Gentiles. He's going to cut off the apostate nation of Israel now. Um, and so. And so since because all this is going to happen, God tells the believing remnant just to wait for him to do it. Don't try to take matters into their own hands or don't yield to the Antichrist and join his kingdom. Wait for God to bring in his kingdom. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 8 says, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. So God says, you know, the Antichrist, the apostate nation is really persecuted. You're going through the fire, but God's going to save you at the end. Just wait on him. Uh, verse 9, For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. You see the start of that in Acts chapter 2. Remember in Genesis chapter 11, the, all of the earth was under one language. And then he confounded the languages there because they united against God. Well, in Acts chapter 2, he reverses that with the Holy Spirit coming. And they and you have all these people, the Jews who are coming to Pentecost for the Feast of Pentecost. And they, they know Hebrew, but they also know other dialects depending on where what nation they're in because they're scattered abroad according to the uh, Leviticus 26 cycles of chastisement where God scattered them among the heathen. They know these other languages. And in Acts chapter 2, you have the, the uh, apostles there, the 120 that were gathered, they're speaking in other tongues, and they're speaking in languages that those, that those Jews can understand. And so that's God's reverse. In Genesis chapter 11, he's bringing all back together on the language, but it's only the believers who he speaks through. And so then in that coming kingdom, when God destroys all the wicked there and he gets rid of all that, he doesn't have to worry about them coming and rebelling against him and like he did it back in Genesis 11. Therefore, it's in verse 9, Then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. So in Genesis chapter 11, you had all the, na all the nations as one language and they all rebelled against the Lord with one consent. They were united against the Lord. But in God's coming kingdom after he destroys the wicked, he gets rid of uh, the 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 Antichrist and the false prophet and all those who followed him, then he's going to have everybody, instead of being united against the Lord, everybody's going to serve him with one consent and they're all going to have that one language uh, as a, a divine gift of the Holy Ghost there so that they can all understand each other and be united in serving him and they won't have that barrier of language there.
uh, God promises that they will dwell in Israel safely in the kingdom. And verse 11, it says, In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. Remember, the law talks about how you've got to help the poor, help the fatherless, help those people. And they're going to be uh, the nation of Israel, the saved nation of Israel in God's millennial kingdom. They're going to be obeying the law. Well, how can you help the poor people and the afflicted if there aren't any afflicted and poor people? And so that's why God says there, I will leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people. And so those are people who can you can help out according to the law and then those people are going to trust in the name of the Lord. Uh, so God does promise that he, he's going to deliver the little flock after, after the end of the tribulation period in God's kingdom forever. And you can see in verse 15 where God is that king. It says, The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy, the king of Israel. Even the Lord is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. So we talked about it earlier in an earlier book about how they didn't have a king. They reject First Samuel chapter 8. They rejected God as their king. And they had a man as king. And then when the captivity came, the times of the Gentiles under Babylon, and the Medes and Persians, the Grecians, the Romans, and then finally an Antichrist kingdom. They have someone over them. It's not their king. It's a different king over them. They don't even have a king. But God's going to restore them again where he's going to be their king. That's in his coming kingdom. That's according to Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 15, where the Lord he, it says he's going to be the king of Israel. Even the Lord is in the midst of thee. And uh, finally, there, the last verse tells you, it says, At that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you, for I will make you a name and in all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. So again, that captivity, or in this case, uh, in Zephaniah's day, it was the captivity uh, going into Babylon. And the, the full fulfillment of it in the future, it's the being in captivity in the sense that they're kicked out of the nation of Israel by the Antichrist and the apostate rulers, and they have to flee out of there. And so God's going to bring them back at the end of the tribulation period, uh, return them again, and that's a people that's going to be his name. And really all that, the fire of the tribulation period and the captivity and them not being his people that time is all about building a believing remnant because if they keep going the way they are and being ruling their own selves in the nation, it's just going to be wickedness and there won't be even a, a remnant to be saved. So God uh, is Israel both with the Babylonian captivity and with the future tribulation period. Uh, not because he's a meanie, not because he wants to, but it's so that a faithful remnant could come trusting in the Lord, trusting in God's word, not trusting in the Antichrist, but trusting in God's word. And as a result, then, they will enter God's kingdom and dwell there forever. So I'm sorry I had to rush through those last three books there, but we do want to uh, continue going through the Bible. And next week we'll pick up here in Haggai and uh, finish the Old Testament. Uh, so then, then we'll start the New Testament the week following, and I'll try to uh, slow down, not cover as many chapters once we get to the New Testament so we can go through some of the detail there, especially since uh, the church as a whole, Christianity as a whole, studies the New Testament far more than, than the Old Testament. And w when you don't rightly divide, there's a lot of misunderstanding, especially in the Gospels. So we're going to spend a lot of time going through the Gospels, uh, but still trying to cover it at a good rate uh, so we can continue going through the Bible. So want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and uh, thank, sorry that I went over but we did have a lot to uh, cover here I hope it was edifying to you this video will be on YouTube we'll have it there so you can, again if you want to get some of the scripture references that I uh, said real fast in my haste to get through those books so uh, join us again next time next week let's just close in a word of prayer uh, dear Lord I just thank you for your word and as we study through the minor prophets, this area of scripture that, uh, frankly, is neglected by your people today, um, I thank you, Lord, that we can glean some truth out of it. And we can see, like we saw in Habakkuk, that um, the just shall live by faith. And for us, it's that faith of the Son of God. And so I thank you, Lord, for the truths that we learn and how we're edified. And that all scripture is profitable for us today. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to continue 
to read through your word that your Holy Spirit will guide us into the truths of your word so that we may have that mind of Christ and allow the Lord to live through us so that we won't be like Jonah and be tossed to and fro by circumstances but that we will uh, be standing in the mind of Christ and rejoice evermore regardless of what us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining us. Have a good night. See you next week. God bless.